My name is Percy Mystery, and this is a pre-recorded presentation for the 2020 meeting of the Society for Mathematical Psychology. Welcome to the Symposium on Computational Model-Based Cognitive Neuroscience. I will be speaking about approaches to combine evidence accumulation models with fMRI data. When you look at different approaches to establishing such brain behavior relationships, the most elementary way is a two-stage or correlation in approach using canonical cognitive models. Yeah. The fMRI data is used with a neural model to extract key neural features, and a standard cognitive model, for example, the drift diffusion model, might be used to describe behavioral data and infer key cognitive parameters. The relationships between these cognitive and neural mechanisms can then be examined. There are now many examples of such correlational approaches with canonical models in literature. In recent times, there has been a greater attention paid to moving towards more integrative approaches. The key difference here is that you have a single joint model to describe both the behavioral and fMRI data, and this model infers both cognitive and neural measures and is able to describe the joint relationship between them. This approach has its obvious advantages in terms of modeling joint un uncertainty uh, by constraining behavioral and neural data with each other, and once again, there is a fair bit of literature out here now espousing this cause. At this stage, I'd like to provide a very quick illustration here using a social perceptual task. In this task, children and adolescents had to differentiate between their mother's voices and unfamiliar female voices, as well as other non-human environmental sounds. A key objective was to look at the neural signatures of social communication as the importance of novel and non-familial social communication partners increased over a developmental period. Here we used a standard drift diffusion model to characterize the voice recognition process, but added an integrative neural element. We looked at the key brain modules, including voice processing, salience network, the reward network, and the DMN or default mode network that characterizes self-awareness. The connectivity within these network modules, as well as between these modules, was provided as an input into the drift rate model, and the drift rate was constructed as a linear function of their connectivity matrices. The model uncovered interesting insights that analysis based purely on reaction time or accuracy, or even external variables such as age or social reward scores could not identify. Specifically, it uncovered significant differences in the reward to DMN connectivity, such that higher connectivity was related to higher perceptual sensitivity to unfamiliar voices, but lower perceptual sensitivity to mother's voices. So yes, canonical or standard models such as the DDM model can be used to reveal significant insights from fMRI data. But my primary agenda here today is to examine a different dimension. One of augmenting canonical models, for example, drift diffusion model, to obtain process-dissociated models that can further capture the latent structure of neurocognitive subprocesses. These models augment canonical models like the DDM with context-specific subprocesses. So first, let me address the need for such an approach. First of all, many cognitive models, especially evidence accumulation models, are probabilistic in nature. And trial by trial variability is often structured in as random effect variability. Thus, as is well known, there is no one-to-one -one mapping of the data and parameters at the level of a single trial. On the other hand, fMRI data is known to contain a high degree of temporal variability. And to draw a connection between the dynamics of neural and cognitive processes, we need to be able to model systemic variability in the cognitive parameters of a trial that goes beyond random effect variability. As an example, we could envisage a belief updating or performance monitoring process that systematically drives the dynamic changes in DDM parameters, such as decision thresholds or non-decision time over trials. Second, repeated decision-making is often characterized by a mixture of cognitive states or strategies across trials. We might expect that the fMRI characterization of these different states and strategies will be very different and not accounting for them, even if non-dominant states or strategies form a very small percentage of overall trials, will significantly dilute the measure, measured brain behavior relationships. The solution is to have state-dependent or strategy-dependent de DDM models at a trial level with a hierarchical state or strategy switching process built in. Third, the repeated decision-making often involves sequential or item gradient effects, such as the influence of poster learning or strategy repetition effects, etc. And building these into the cognitive model allow for a better characterization of temporal variability. And finally, canonical parameters by themselves, even if incorporated with trial-level systemic variability, may not be sufficient to capture the characterization of multiple neurocognitive systems. Even simple tasks, for example, uh, might contain many different cognitive elements, such as executive function, memory 
belief updating, learning effects, performance monitoring, and so on. We expect fMRI data to contain footprints of these cognitive subsystems, but to allow capturing such functional resolution from the fMRI data, we need corresponding behavioral or co cognitive measures that will allow a much more finer grained multi-dimensional functional characterization of individual differences. These parameters in turn will also govern the systemic temporal variability in the dynamic DDM parameters that we've described above. So a process dissociated model may include one or more of these aspects. It is important that this does not imply fundamentally changing the nature of the decision-making model. For instance, a drift diffusion model would still remain the unit of decision-making at a trial level. What I'm proposing is that the need to augment such models with context-sensitive structural mechanisms that both account for temporal variability and systemic individual differences in a much more precise manner, allowing a much more precise functional measurement of brain behavior relationships. So let's see what a model like that would look like across two different tasks. I'd like to highlight at the stage that a lot of the results here are preliminary results that may be subject to validation and revision, and also that given the time constraints, the idea is to give you an idea about the type of results that such models allow us to obtain, rather than have an in-depth analysis of the actual results. So the first task is a mathematical cognition task where uh, children had to do simple arithmetic problems, and we had three sub data sets here with similar stimuli but st slightly different procedures. Each of which, um, one of which includes eight weeks of an in-person cognitive training. And the performance of arithmetic problems in that particular data set was measured both pre and post training. A key, key question across these data sets was to understand the basis of individual differences in arithmetic performance, whether there were any structural brain differences in children with mathematical learning difficulties, and of course, what specific effects did the cognitive training have both on brain and behavioral measures. Based on previous literature, we constructed a model that accounted for both high and low attentional processes. The high attention process itself involved the choice of multiple strategies, such as memory retrieval, different forms of counting or decomposition of the arithmetic problem. A DDM was used as the fundamental unit of decision making, and each strategy had its own DDM drift rate characterized using an item response framing, such that it was a combination of individual item and strategy level features. The nature of the strategy provided theoretical inputs as to how the drift rate should vary across items. This subjective theoretical approach is very important to be able to constrain parameters and identify unique states and strategies. The process was characterized as an autonomous default to memory retrieval, which is represented by the blue diffusion process in the illustration, followed by a probabilistic switching to an alternate strategy if the memory retrieval process did not yield a confident answer within a certain time. A layer of executive function parameters control the strategy switching process. In the illustration, the red line illustrates a switch to a counting strategy. In addition, the decision threshold was modulated across trials by characterizing an error effort trade-off, such that the threshold was increased after higher error rates and reduced after longer decision times. Each of these aspects was allowed to be governed by individual difference parameters. The model was implemented within a Bayesian inference framework in JAGS, and overall, the idea is that there is a dynamic set of parameters that vary systematically at a trial by trial level. And these dynamic set of parameters, which are analogous to canonical sort of drift diffusion parameters, are hierarchically dependent on a set of novel individual level parameters that characterize different cognitive functional subsystems that we've introduced here. We then use this model in a two-stage correlational approach to map this much richer representation of individual differences onto fMRI data each using uh, the cognitive parameters as covariates in a GLM model. Preliminary results show that the fMRI brain task positive activation can be broken down into distinct functional areas based on using the different latent variables characterizing subprocesses. A canonical model using a single process and thus assuming a memory-like process that applies across trials without the deep systemic temporal variability that we've built in here was not able to functionally isolate brain regions in such a manner. Importantly, we also used a host of different methods to validate the behavioral inferences and showed that the process dissoci dissociated model provided much more stronger validation compared to a canonical uh, or vanilla drift diffusion model. We validated that the model inferred item level difficulties, the item level strategy switching inferences, RT characteristics of different strategies and sequential effects were all in line with either theoretical or empirical expectations 
or the conclusions drawn by independent observers that observed and interviewed the same set of children in an out-of-scanner task. A canonical model provided weaker validation on almost all of these criteria. Next, we use this model on a second sub-data set with similar stimuli to classify participants here into clusters based on the cognitive model parameters. This clustering was done within the model inference process itself with a priori theoretical expectations about how certain model parameters might classify children into those with lower or higher learning difficulties. Initial results not only reveal a promising clustering score when assessed against independent standardized testing, but also show a significant correlational relationship with brain measures. Specifically, children with lower scores were found to have a higher representational similarity in certain brain regions, characterizing poorer ability to distinguish clearly between addition and subtraction problems. Once again, a canonical approach was unable to derive such clusters or find such relationships. Finally, we had a third subset of data with similar stimuli and eight weeks of training where we found significant changes in the network connections and modularity after training. We found that the diversity coefficient, which is the network measure of the connectivity for the hippocampal and anterior insular regions reduced post-training with larger de decreases predicting higher increases in the accuracy post-training. We implemented a simple integrative model. The graphical representation of that model is shown here, which is basically the process dissociation model we just described, but we added in a layer of the change in the brain network connectivity measures and used the change in the drift diffusion model parameters to predict the change in the brain measures. This model showed that the posterior predictive of the change in brain measures was very robustly predicted by the change in the drift diffusion model parameters. And this that's shown in the figure on the right. The figure on the left shows the same analysis using a canonical DDM model without the process dissociation. And you can see that this added process dissociation uh, gives much more stronger and robust measure of how the changes in drift diffusion parameters induced by training result in a better posterior predictive about the changes in the brain network connectivity. We were also able to isolate between whether the effect of such training was to induce a shift in more efficient strategies or improve the efficacy of existing strategy use. And in this case, the change in modularity induced by the particular training was linked strongly to improved efficacy of existing memory use. Lastly, I want to talk to you about a more sophisticated integrative model that we implement for a stop signal task. This is a response inhibition paradigm where pa participants have to select the right target based on a stimulus, but have to hold back the responses if they observe an explicit stop signal. This data was obtained from children, including children diagnosed with ADHD, and a relevant question here was to identify structural differences in children with ADHD and how that might manifest into overt behavior. Once again, we started with the canonical horse race model where go and stop accumulators compete, but we then augmented this model with attentional switching dynamics to model attentional lapses, performance monitoring to govern the dynamics of decision threshold changes, and most importantly, we added a belief updating subprocess that allows for the assumption that people were tracking either the probability, the timing, or both of the stop signal delay signal, and that people would then adjust or withhold their responses based on what they had learned so far. We, of course, allowed for individual differences in such learning as well as sensitivity to learned contingencies. On the other hand, for the fMRI data, recent studies have shown attentional state space dynamics where the covariance across different brain regions is temporarily clustered to detect changes in cognitive states. However, this does not integrate any behavioral element into it. And the states are clustered not based on a priori theories, but in an ad hoc manner. In our approach, we combined these two mechanisms. We mapped covariance patterns across 11 different pre-selected brain ROIs, allowing for a restricted number of cognitive states where each state corresponded to an a priori interpretation of high or different forms of low attentional lapses. The generative model thus has a state-dependent drift diffusion model, which generates behavior, and a state-dependent fMRI connectivity model that generates the connectivity covariances. And the state-dependent drift diffusion models differentiate between high and low attentional states based on whether the belief updating system is actively invoked, whether it malfunctions, or whether there is a decision threshold lapse that occurs, uh, resulting in a fast go attentional lapse. First, we demonstrate how systemic temporal variability and individual differences in such variability get captured by the model, illustrating inferences about two participants. Here, the dots show the actual stop signal delays, while the gray lines show the inferred tracking by individuals. And you can see that there are individual differences in how these signals get tracked. 
Having factored such dynamics into the model, what does this give us? We compared the state-dependent inferred ROI connectivity and checked for group-level differences between participants that scored low versus high on various ADHD-related test measures. In each case, the canonical horse race model, which is the left column, could not infer significant differences between the two groups, but the processed associated model, which is the right column, inferred stronger differences between these subgroups, showing that processed associated state-dependent connectivity measures can distinguish ADHD subgroups based on various measures such as conduct disorder scores or impulsivity hyperactivity scores. And it's capturing the systematic temporal variability that changes the classification of states and the inferences about what each state's neural representation looks like, allowing us to capture more brain behavior relationships in a robust manner. We've seen a range of different approaches to combining evidence accumulation models with fMRI data. And the key conclusions are that although there are multiple approaches that might be useful, and whilst the discussion between two-stage and integrative models is important, uh, we also need to think about augmenting canonical models with processed associated models that can account for systematic temporal variability and characterize individual differences so that the brain behavior relationships we obtain are stronger and robust. More details of, on the models, including the code, will soon be made available at this Open Science uh, website. A quick thank you to my collaborators, and thank you all for making it to this slide.